Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Andrea Hopling, the GM and SVP for EA Sports. After career spanning 20 years in media, kids TV, and video games, she's left a legacy that will forever pave the way for girls in marketing and sports. Andrea, so great to see you here at CES. Thank you for having me. This Absolutely. is going to be fun. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And thanks so much for joining. I was looking through your background and, you know, you've obviously cut your teeth in the entertainment space and, and came right out of the gate in your career working uh, for Disney and ESPN. Was the entertainment world always a place that you wanted to kind of end up in? You know, um, I've been really thrilled and honored and, you know, worked quite hard to build a career at the intersection of sports, entertainment and technology. I've always loved the idea of um, and the motivations behind fans. I'm obsessed with the business of fandom. And so the career choices have been, you know, both intentional and opportunistic along the way, but super excited on the journey of, that it's taken me and the things that I've gotten to accomplish along the way. Absolutely. And in terms of the intersection of that and marketing, um, why was that an area that you decided to specifically pursue within the world of entertainment? Um, I think it really goes back to really being that obsession with fandom and really trying to understand why people fall in love with what they fall in love with. Yeah. You know, we all either have a team or a show or a character or a world or a type of competition that we just love and getting deep and really understanding those consumer first motivations for why you love what you love really was at the heart of me becoming a marketer but it's obviously transcended into very different spaces and allowed me to grow big businesses now yeah, and really sure. lead with that consumer first orientation yeah and, and it's not lost to me that you you started your career off at disney and when i interview a lot of people on the podcast that are in CPG or food, a lot of them start at Procter and Gamble, and because the discipline that they learn at a company like that, they're able to take for their careers. And I imagine you being in the entertainment space is very similar with Disney because it's a world like leader in entertainment. As you look back on your time at Disney, what are some of the main takeaways that you were able to, I guess, take with you for the, your other roles that you would then yeah. take part in? I mean, I think that Disney was a masterclass in building a brand. Yeah. And building a grant a brand that has deep storytelling at its core, but multi-dimensional entry points for consumers to come in yep. and find their way and to express their personal um, fandom. And so, you know, whether you're a Star Wars fan or a you know a Marvel fan or a Mickey Mouse fan, like you know, there's plenty of ways. Whether you come in through the parks, come through in through a comic book, come in through a T-shirt or a toy. Um, you know, Ma Disney was a masterclass in building a brand and creating brand extensions that in multiple that, channels, correct? Yep. That tell the story in a, in a variety of different ways and access points. I think you know, to your point on consumer products, many people coming in from Procter and Gamble. I was very lucky to have been able to go spend some time at Hasbro later in my career, yeah. in the middle of my career, where it really taught me the art of commercializing a brand through product sure. as well. And so I've kind of gotten both ends of those spectrum those spectrum in my career. Right, because Disney, it was more of licensing agreements, right? When it came to the toy category. Correct, yeah, Disney for me was about building audiences and sharing our stories and you know driving eyeballs and imagine the ip i imagine as well ip management and in hasbro in particular i run the girls business there um and was responsible for the disney princess and frozen business and commercializing that through play and through toy and product so let's talk about um your stint at hasbro because obviously it is a much different role than working at disney you also have to think about the retail footprint and working with those channel partners so i guess what were some of your focuses and, and takeaways there Hasbro was really the first opportunity for me to transition from driving audiences and driving fan growth into really commercializing a business. Yeah. You know, I was responsible for a full p and um, responsible for a team that oversaw SKU development, um, product development, and the engineering of those products. And also, the, really, to your point, the sell-in and sell-through to retail and to e-commerce players. And so it really taught me the art of full business management, um, which was an exciting and totally eye-opening chapter of my career. I remember the first time... I went to China and met with some of our manufacturers in China. Probably pretty eye-opening, right? Eye-opening. Right. And even just thinking about the things that, as a consumer, you don't think about. You know, As I mentioned, I ran the fashion doll business, the princess business. And so the art of stitching the seams and the, on the little tiny fabric dresses and the art of rooting hair and just the choices you have to make in terms of how do you make the right choices that 
ensure that the product um, is exciting and delivers on the features and benefits that you're selling to the consumer, but also knowing how you make money as a business yeah. too. Yeah, and also I would imagine it has to be reliable in terms of the supply chain and making sure all you can manage the inventory and get it to your retail partners. All of it. And so it's like, a, you know, a marketer through and through the learning, the art of really owning and developing and leading a business through, you know, that consumer first lens. It was a game changing career opportunity for me yeah. that I think has been one of the most fundamental for me in terms of my the, the future from that point. And the other unique thing about a Hasbro is, you know, when you're marketing a product that's consumed by children, the the audience is obviously the parents as well, mm -hmm. which is so it's an art form to marketing, which is unlike somebody who's marketing Coca Cola as a person that drinks Coca Cola. So talk to me about that approach and how you're able to refine that over time. It's why the art of storytelling is so important across the board, and why insights are really you know the driver of any great marketer's you know success. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Um. When I, so when I came to Hasbro, my first day on the job, my boss said to me, sort of, she gave me one of those surprise moments of welcome to the company and surprise and um, handed me an RFP from Disney. She said, you know, we know we just hired you right. and you've just worked at Disney, but um, guess what? Welcome back. And the RFP was for the Disney Princess and Frozen business. So you were competing with other toy manufacturers to get the license you can manufacture Correct. on that IP. Correct. Right. Thank you. And, um, and you know, uh, the Disney princess business had been going through a little bit of um, maybe a wane in perception from parents. I think parents were, um, parents saw the princesses as, you know, the beautiful debonair right. stereotypical, women, stereotypical right. you know, just waiting to be kissed, right. um, you know. Lacked female uh, empowerment. Correct, right. correct, correct. Which Disney then made up for in later films, but yeah, correct. They, right. But it was really the start of the next chapter for Disney and the princess and frozen business, which was really rooted in a, in a core theme. It became a multidimensional theme called Dream Big Princess. And it was about celebrating the inner strengths of all the princesses. And so whether that was, um, Tiana, who was an amazing cook, or yeah. Merida, who was an athlete, you or know, Moana, comes Moana to mind as well. yep. exactly, yep. Moana, or, um, and and so it became really, it was a really fun challenge for me because I got to reinvent the product strategy for toy and play, in how we celebrated the inner strengths, and we built Rapunzel toys that had Rapunzel's long flowing beautiful hair become the paintbrush for the canvases of our that. art, and the pack out, you know, we packed the toys out, so instead of having, you know, featuring their beautiful clothes we put them in really strong heroic poses inside the boxes and it became a really fun marketing challenge for us to um, work with disney to really celebrate the new theme of dreaming big and telling the parents the story as much as telling the young girls and boys who would buy our product yeah it's interesting because disney has these tales in some instances that are as old as time and they continue with that in the IP, but then the world changes around them. Mm -hmm. And then they have to adapt. But it's easy if you are marketing sneakers and you could just change the design to make right. it more contemporary. But you talking about these stories, it I would imagine becomes a little bit more challenging. Yes, characters, stories, and worlds. And you know, the good news is there's endless threads to pull. You just have to kind of dig a little deeper and find the insight. And I always feel like the insight leads to the innovation. Yeah, and and, and Disney obviously it's going to be interesting, you know, Bob Iger came back and they're trying to, you know, I, I think juggle a lot of challenges and opportunities in the space. Their theme park business seems to be, continue to do great. Um, and then the streaming business is highly competitive. And it's just going to be interesting to see how they compete with the Netflixes of the world, even the Amazons of the world moving forward. Yep, I'm I'm rooting for them. Yes. Um, so you you made the jump um, from Hasbro um, to EA to gaming. And obviously gaming is something different than your past um, roles that you had prior you're marketing to largely a different audience and it's a obviously space that moves a lot quicker than some of the ip we were talking about what did you see in the opportunity at ea to make you uh, jump on that opportunity yeah for me you know i saw tremendous synergies from the things that i knew very well yeah IP characters worlds aren't much aren't that different than athletes teams leagues you know and why people fall in love with those things aren't that different it's you fandom know? it's fandom yeah. at the heart of it it's fandom and so I loved very much staying rooted in brands and that make emotional connections with audiences I I can tell you that 
personally, I knew that my own career had a gap in it. Um, I had not spent any time deeply in sort of digital or technology led businesses. And I saw such an interesting opportunity at EA Electronic Arts to combine my strengths and the things and the power of play. I certainly knew play and very well at that point from an analog play yeah. through toy but to transition to an interactive space. Far more immersive space. Far more immersive um, and operating really at a much greater pace and speed. Absolutely. And, you know, we're here at CES in Vegas and there's so much innovation being discussed. What do you see in the gaming industry in the future? I had um, an interview with Shahar Scott from Meta Reality Labs talking about the things that they're doing um, with their, um, you know, VR lenses and how that's going to be a huge intersection with gaming. I imagine you have no shortage of conversations at EA about similar topics. Uh, where do you see gaming headed? I think for us, the future of sport and the future of gaming is truly um, interactive and connecting fans. We have one of the largest sport fan communities on the planet with you know hundreds of millions of, of people coming into our experiences on an annual basis and not only do they love to play but they love to connect it's a they're community they're connect connecting with a community yeah. of like-minded fans in a space where they can participate and play together uh, it's really powerful and so you'll see i think the future is really rooted in harnessing the power of connectivity through interactive experiences and continuing to build onto that in ways that reduce fiction, particularly for sports fans who are watching, are playing, are connecting, are creating around sport, and they also are participating. I, I so think bet online betting is, a, I mean, that's driving even more engagement. You see it everywhere. I was at an NBA game last week and everyone around, for better or for worse, it is what it is, the leagues are embracing it. Yep. Everybody is putting five hours in a game or a hundred hours in a game and, and to bring people closer and closer to the sport. Yeah. Fantasy sports, all those things. All of it. So there's um, uh, an incredible opportunity to continue to to lean in to connecting fans across all of the dimensions of their sport fandom. And also, um, you know, an ability for us to keep leaning in. We have one of the youngest audiences in sports at EA Sports. If you think about the youngest generation's first form of entertainment now yeah. is gaming. And so the position we hold and are able to continue to drive forward in leading the future of sport in an interactive way. I think we're really well positioned yeah, for that. Yeah, it's two-way because I think that as much as, um, you know, the NFL takes advantage of of Madden. Madden kind of takes advantage of the NFL both ways. You know, younger kids, when they when they play Madden, it teaches them about the game, teaches them about the players. And then when they get older, they're more likely to take their kid to an NFL game because they've been engaged with the sport in a way they might otherwise not have. Yeah, they you know, the youngest generation is athlete first now. Yeah. Athlete first, then team, then league. Right. And it's it, almost like music. They like the song versus the album. Correct. Yeah. And fancy sports is a big reason why. Exactly. For sure. And, you know, we um, inside of our games, you know, they're learning about sport. They're learning about team. They're learning athlete stats in ways that, you know, surprise and delight us. You know, they know more about, you know, the strength of the cornerback on this team, you know, ESPN might not be talking about it, but certainly they, the, they as fans now know Absolutely. about it through their exposure through our games. We've heard countless stories of youth who are growing up and learning about sport through EA Sports. And not only are they playing and engaging and becoming lifelong fans of sport, but they're also participating in sports. So, you know, you hear about, I heard one the other day, you know, someone was telling me about how their son played Madden and then decided to go try out for the high school football team. And it was through his, the fun he had playing and connecting with the sport through our game that led him to become an athlete as well. That's awesome. There's other, there's other learning opportunities too with Madden because me and my son play all the time. He's older now, but I remember giving him like an allowance to buy the coins where you can buy players. Yeah. And I remember he was probably 11 years old and he had to decide, am I going to get two good players or one great player for the 50 coins I have? For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, in Madden, you could build your own team and trade players with other people and try to build the ultimate team. You also buy players with coins. Correct. That's a whole new kind of gameplay modality that didn't exist five, 10 years ago. It's definitely one of the really fun ways and one of the most competitive ways of playing um, some of our sports games at EA Sports. Uh, and, uh, and yes, exactly to your point, teaches a view about the strategy of sport and what it means to be a manager. Yep, you absolutely. Know, a club manager or a GM of yeah. a team. Yep. 
And and we've talked about American football, but I know a huge title that you work on is what's more known as football around the world, um, which is soccer, what we call soccer. And a, a big title um, that EA has in that area was um, FIFA, but is getting rebranded. Talk to me about that property overall and the what the thinking behind rebranding it is. So we rebranded um, FIFA to EA, EA Sports FC this past year, which was... Um arguably one of the largest entertainment rebrands in history. Yeah, and probably not a decision you took. You guys took lightly. We did not right. take it lightly, gosh. Um, no, that was a bit of a hand wringer for us. We've been in the business for a couple of decades now and have amassed hundreds of millions of fans that come back annually to play our game. And we're incredibly proud of that. And to that insight, you know, of, of our fans being you know, fans of athletes first, then teams, then clubs. You know, in addition to our partnership with FIFA, we've also had partnerships with over 300 different licenses underneath FIFA to deliver this really- All the individual game. leagues. Yeah, this yeah. really special game that we have. Um, for us, you know, as we think about the future of sport and we think about the future of interactivity, um, we're really focused on a couple of components. We play certainly as a fundamental, but watch, um, create, connect and participate. As we think about our own ambition spaces, um, it became a natural moment for us to start to push up, to push the boundaries um, and really start setting out onto our own. We knew that we had to do it right though. And there were three components of doing it right. One was authenticity. And so the maintaining of the over 19,000 players, you know, 700 teams and clubs inside the game. Um, two was the uh, innovation, you know, annually we're driving significant year on year innovation and making sure that um, we're De delivering the best yeah then then it makes it worthwhile for somebody to upgrade this year's title a hundred percent yeah and then purpose which was an opportunity for us to really start to own and to drive more resin reach and resonance for our own brand in the market and so you've seen us maybe seen us launch some initiatives like fc futures where we're really investing in grassroots sport and really trying to lead our own brand forward yeah, and, and the sport of soccer is obviously really taking hold in the U.S. When uh, Leo Messi came to Miami this year, it was like the Beatles stepping foot um, in New York. So it was it, it's incredible to see how this is spreading in with the Olympics and the World Cup. And it, it, I just feel like it continues to gain momentum as a sport. The momentum is huge. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in North America. The World Cup certainly held Messi, as you're right. I would also say the, NW, the NWSL. And the acceleration of the NWSL yeah. here in North America has been a big driver for sport, particularly among youth. Yeah, I mean, the Olympics has really, I think, drawn a lot of attention to women's soccer players. And, and you know, they've been very competitive, certainly more competitive than the male U.S. team. And I think that's yeah. driven a lot of popularity in the U.S. as well. So in terms of the, the business of video games, uh, you know, your business used to be you had to go into GameStop or whatever and buy the discs and then it became basically all streaming now and imagine most of your sales are, are streaming so does that mean that you're just a direct to consumer company now and how's that change the way that you go to market because I would imagine retailers are for a small piece of pie our business has definitely shifted over yeah. the last decade um, we're seeing significantly more digital transaction I would say um Without you know having a specific number, I would say the lion's share of our yeah. business has digital now, um, but we still have really important partners that help us deliver that business. So certainly we do have physical retailers, and you will see us across all of them around the world, and you know the big ones and the smaller ones around the world. Um, but you know we have great partners, you know partners like Microsoft, partners like Sony, and Steam, and and others that are also helping us their distribution dis partners. distribute our game through their consoles. And so um, they, they're they an important partner of ours as we continue to deliver. And usually you find someone's like, oh, I play on Xbox, and oh, I play, or I play on PlayStation. I think what's most important about the work we do is to reduce the barrier of fan for fans between right. those platforms. And so really, over the last couple of years, we've significantly increased the technology that allows um, cross-platform play. I was going to Ask so, you about that. Yeah, for so me to be able to find you on if PlayStation on Xbox, not, right? Correct, and you know, not letting that be a barrier for fans. Yeah, absolutely. So as we look um, ahead to 2024 and beyond, uh, and we, we're here to see, yes, what are some of the innovations that you're excited about, either relative to their impact on the gaming industry or otherwise, that you know, in your role, you have your eye on. 
there's a couple. Um, uh, we've been working on a, a number of things that sort of start to push the bounds of um, who we are and what we represent. I mentioned to you that I'm really excited about the potential for EA Sports to be a leader in the future of sport. And that um, comes with sort of expanding ourselves into new categories and um, taking on new challenges. Um, this past year, we partnered with Nike and we launched an Air Max 90, a custom Air Max 90 so cool. inside of Madden for Madden fans. And um, they were able to purchase it inside of our game uh, and then also get a virtual pair of those Air Max 90s for their avatar. That's awesome. And so that's just, so they got the physical shoe and the virtual. And so, you know, that was an expansion of our capabilities in driving commerce. Um, you're seeing us partner with, uh, it, traditional entertainment partners in new ways. We partnered with Ted Lasso inside of EA Sports FC last year and did, you know, a whole AFC Ricks, uh, AFC Richmond um, uh, experience, which was uh, amazing. So I think you're going to continue to see us push the lines in those spaces. In-game advertising. Um, I would, yeah, partnerships, deep right. partnerships. But you do in-game advertising as well, don't you? Um, inside of our mobile games, in-game in -game advertising is more is more common. Gotcha. Because I, I recall at one point seeing logos of brands inside your games you're so d core to who we are is to deliver the authenticity of sport. got it so, so i'm it. a yeah i'm a big f1 fan and so you know as you're racing you know if you're on the vegas grand prix circuit or the miami circuit you'll see a lot of the partners in sport whether it's the dhl bridge or Aramco, just for realism because it's it it, it supports the authenticity of yeah. delivering our games that's awesome and what about AI? Do you think that, I mean, I would imagine that it's got to have a big impact moving forward in the world of gaming. We've been, um, we've been really focused on uh, motion graph, motion, what's the word, Claudia, I'm looking for? Um, motion, what's the, ML, machine learning. That's okay, what I'm yeah. looking for. So let me redo this. Yeah, of course. Um, machine learning has been a really big um driver of our ability to drive realism inside yeah. of our game. And it's been incredible to see. It's, and it's, massively, massively changed the way we're able already to drive very specific play styles uh, for our players and to show the uniqueness of athletes and how they actually- Their mannerisms. Their mannerisms, the way the they, way they dribble, bodies. the way they move their bodies. And so that's been, you know, machine learning has been a big part of our development for some time and will continue to be. Yeah, it's fascinating. So um, zooming out, um, you know, as we wrap up here, Andrea, like you've had such a cool career working in companies like Disney and Hasbro um, and now EA. And, you know, a lot of people who go into marketing lo would love to have the career that you've had uh, to date and to play in such a fun space as well as you know play at the highest level of business what advice do you have for maybe younger people that are listening to the podcast that are at the beginning of their career that want to be able to pursue a similar path what are some of the things that you think you did right to enable you to have these opportunities i have a personal mantra that i like to share a lot which is really just the three c's okay um the first is confidence you know you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to have the confidence that it's okay to ask a question. It's okay to open a door, and that you, um, you know, you gotta believe in yourself a little bit. The second is candor, you know, um, being able to spot the things and have a point of view. That comes along with confidence. It does come it? with confidence. Yeah, it totally does. And the third is curiosity, and really, they're not in any order. Sure. But you know, being curious, asking deep questions. I think all of those allow you to have really interesting conversations and open your mind to perspectives that you may not have considered. And actually, um, I find that the curiosity to be one of the most interesting things when you have someone curious sitting by your side, asking you lots of questions and really thinking thoughtfully about your business. Those are the people that I wanna hire. Those are the people that that are showing me that they have the right brain space to, to push boundaries, to experiment and to progress. And so curiosity, candor, confidence, those are probably three of the most important ingredients to drive a career forward. And how do you think embracing those tents have been different for you being a woman or a young woman in business when you first got started? Because you know some industries are more male dominated and maybe there some people could think that they don't have the license or permission to be candid, maybe as much as males do and you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. on that. Look, imposter syndrome is real, male or female. Yeah. And um, I have worked in a lot of male dominated spaces over the course of my career. I think, you know, really bolstering my own confidence, even if it meant faking it till I made it. Um, I think that's been one of the more important things, but also being authentically me, 
and showing up and you know keep trying absolutely well we're gonna leave it with that thank you so much andrews it's been awesome cannot wait to uh continue to see your uh, success from afar and uh can't wait to see the new games you guys are going to have coming out in the next year. So it's Thank going to be you. awesome. Yes, look forward to college football. Yeah, I'll give you a little... Oh, I was going to ask you about that. Go Blue, by Go the way. Blue, Congrats yes. on Michigan. Thank you. Is college football coming out? We are looking forward to an exciting uh, summer for college football. Okay, there you go. So th there you have it, and we'll see what that means uh, moving forward. So on behalf of Susie and every team, thanks again to Andrea Hopelain, SVP of EA Sports, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.